Good afternoon to you. Mark Seth of HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Wednesday, the 19th of July, 2023. On the update today, you bet, we'll talk about this new development potential down in the main development region. And, of course, we have Don out there that's going to hang around a little while longer, a tropical storm. And then wait till I show you what happened with Calvin over in the Central Pacific as it went by Hawaii. Uh, probably should put up one of those NSFW disclaimers, not suitable for work, because the satellite presentation, wow, like it really got shredded. So prepare yourselves, all right? We'll look at that and also my trip to the desert southwest. i got a couple tabs open because I'm leaving tomorrow for about a week, and I'll discuss why, what we will be doing, and so forth and so on. So let's get started, shall we? Good to have you join in. I do appreciate it. As always, let's look at the Hurricane Center homepage to start. There's Don, 40 mile per hour winds. This could strengthen a little bit more over the next few days. That's the track it is expected to take as it kind of goes around various features in the atmosphere, only of concern to marine interests, so no worries in terms of land impacts. Well, you know what? Actually, there are some waves that are coming out, these long period swells. They do make it all the way across, and they are being picked up by some of the sensors, and that could lead to an increase in some rip current activity but it's pretty far out there for much concern from that. This will be our next feature that we're going to watch, tropical wave coming off the coast of Africa, kind of drawn into the monsoon trough out there, some dry air around, as they mentioned uh, in the update here, should prevent significant organization, but environmental conditions could become more conducive for some development by this weekend. Of course, by then it'll be farther to the west, and we're going to want to watch this pretty closely. In the East Pack, uh, one area to watch, but not much chance overall, 30 and 40 in the two-day and seven-day outlooks, respectively. And then in the Pacific, hey, there's Calvin just to the south and west of Hawaii. Now take a look at this on the satellite animation. What a mess. Like, what happened? You remember what it looked like yesterday? There's the low-level center right there. That's part of the mid-level. I mean, it just got left behind. Look at it. You can see some of the rotation in there. This thing got separated, shredded apart. People talk about how Hispaniola is the hurricane shredder when hurricanes approach tropical storms too, and those big islands down there, or the big mountains of uh, Hispaniola, rip those apart. Well, Hawaii seems to do the same kind of thing. You got that big mountain peak there on the big island, and just very strange occurrences take place in the vicinity of Hawaii when these systems come. That's why, part of the reason why, it is so, and thankfully so, difficult to get a direct impact from tropical systems in Hawaii in terms of major wind and surge and that kind of thing. Now, there was some heavy rain, probably had a little bit of localized flooding. I haven't seen anything on social media too dramatic coming from the area, so that's good news. But boy, oh boy, Calvin really getting beat up there as it tracks off to the west. All right, moving on to the east now from the Tropical Tidbits satellite regions here. This is the Eastern Pacific. This is the area that the Hurricane Center has outlined at, uh, what, 30 and 40. By the way, that convective complex right there, that's what brought the ridiculous heavy rainfall impacting Mayfield, Kentucky, where, of course, they had the terrible tornado in 21. Just can't catch a break sometimes from Mother Nature. What a bummer up there, the severe flooding in Mayfield. Again, seeing that on social media today, just heartbreaking. Moving on to the east, uh, and this is a different satellite perspective. We call this the true color. And it's kind of like looking at it as if you were out in outer space looking down with your own two eyes. Similar. There's Dawn. It's over marginally warm water temperatures, so it's got a little bit more deeper convection with it. Nothing to you know, get too excited about in terms of intensity, but it's there. And uh, the water temperatures are going to get a little bit warmer along its path, so it may bump up to... 50 or 60 miles per hour when all is said and done. Meanwhile, off the coast of Africa, it doesn't look like much now, but we do have a tropical wave out here. The trades are pretty slow overall. Um, there is some African dust and dry air still sitting in this area, sure, but it does look like something might try to come of it. And if we look at this, this product from the University of Wisconsin, very helpful here. Look at that moisture envelope coming off with the system there. This is why these different products are so helpful. There's Don, by the way, just kind of spinning along. And then there's that big eruption of moisture that brought all that heavy rain from Mayfield, Kentucky. 
This is the precipitable water, the total precipitable water, a TPW product. That's your ITCZ, the intertropical convergent zone. And this deep colors of red and purples in here, and the northern extent of the whole moisture envelope, that is very interesting. We're starting to erode away the Saharan air layer just a little bit. There's your dry air through here. Definitely still out there, but that's making some pretty good ground, gaining some ground out there coming off Africa. And as this traverses off to the west, conditions might become more favorable. Water temperatures will increase. The low-level moisture, mid-level moisture should also eventually increase. And we might get a system forming out of it. Of course, the anomalies, we're well aware of this. Way warmer than we should be out here relative to the last 30 years. There, of course, is our El Nino. Now, you know this chart very well by now, but look at this. This is just craziness way up in the northwest Atlantic. Not going to focus too much on it right now, but boy, it just jumps out at you. All kinds of strange things happening with the weather. Uh, the ocean temperatures being as warm as they are. The land temperatures, all these big heat ridges. Wow. So what does it mean? Well, the upper ocean heat content, that's also pretty formidable uh, across where this system will be. The system's over here, way off the map. It's going to take it some time, uh, but once it gets past about 40 degrees longitude, the upper ocean heat content really starts to increase. So yes, in a few days, this might be something more notable. By the way, this is the island chain right here. We know, know it as the Lesser Antilles, all the way down to Trinidad and Tobago. I would say Barbados and most of the windwards down here, you're going to want to watch this tropical wave pretty closely. That's just, and I'll show you, I'll kind of explain further in just a minute, but it looks like it's going to ride pretty far to the south, okay? So in a few days, this could be a problem, even if it's just still a tropical wave. Those can bring a lot of moisture, and we're going to want to keep a close eye on that. All right, so let's look at the modeling. What does the different model solutions, what do they show us? Well, this is the GFS. Of course, there are a lot of models, and this thing could go on for an hour, if I went over all of them, we don't have time for that. So I'll show you the GFS operational. This is one of my favorite layers to look at. There's our system of interest right there at the 500, uh, I'm sorry, 850 millibar, 5,000 is what I meant to say. 5,000 feet in the atmosphere, 850 millibars. And we're looking for this. Does it do that? That's Dawn. And this is not Dawn. Okay, this could be future Emily, maybe. All that energy down there, it's all kind of spread out, all these different yellows and oranges and blacks. That's the vorticity, the relative, um, or actually we call it cyclonic vorticity. So we want to see, does it bundle up? So if we move this out into time, 24 hours out, still kind of diffuse and spread out, 48 hours out. It does try to concentrate there. It looks like fairly small. Also notice Dawn gets a lot more prominent, so that could increase. You know what? I'm just going to tell you, it wouldn't shock me the way everything's going if it became a hurricane. Why not? Over the marginally warm waters there of the Atlantic, you know, it's kind of small. Smaller systems aren't seen as well in the global models. Who knows, right? Nevertheless, there's the other one that we need to watch. That's 48 hours out. Like I said, this is 72. And by 72 hours or so, 72 to 78 hours, GFS says, hey, we have a small but developed tropical cyclone down there. Very interesting to see if that comes to pass. Moving this on out, there's day four, day five, day six, and finally by day seven, it starts to approach the windwards there, and that's why I'm telling you, you guys down there in the Trinidad, Tobago area, uh, basically Barbados, south and west to include Trinidad, Tobago, and elsewhere in the windwards and leewards, you don't want to ignore it, but I'm thinking this could be more of a problem farther to the south. That could change depending on where, if anything, does develop. But you notice, too, that even at this level of the atmosphere, the subtropical ridge is pretty prominent, so the steering is going to be generally to the west over time. None of these weaknesses up here breaks in the ridge for this to gain a lot of latitude and just turn out. I don't see that happening, and you don't either because you're watching it with me, right? This is what it looks like on the moisture side of things, the relative humidity at 700 to 300 millibars of the atmosphere. There's that initial push of moisture that I showed you on the, uh, the TPW product from University of Wisconsin. Move this out and just slide it into time. 
Yeah, look at that. You know, it's not real strong or anything, but it's definitely something to watch over the next few days. Um, even Don up here doesn't get too particularly strong. I said, hey, it wouldn't surprise me if it becomes a hurricane. GFS not indicating that, but I'm just, nothing's going to, I don't want to say nothing. It's going to be hard to shock me with all the stuff that's going on this year. So, yeah, we'll watch this system. Definitely has potential. And then even more moisture starting to organize on the southwest part of Africa, extending out into the eastern Atlantic. Yes, dry air also gets pushed out as well, but we're getting closer and closer to August at this time frame. This is that week time frame that I showed you earlier, week out. Yep, it's almost there. This is July 26, just a few more days after that. And it, of course, is August. So to wrap up the tropical part of this, we'll certainly be watching what's happening with that system. Low probability of development. We knew this could be coming. There are factors that could limit development, and there are factors that could potentially foster the development. So we'll just watch together and see what develops over the next several days, quite literally. All right? All right. Now, lower 48. Wow, very, very hot all across the southern tier of the U.S., as you'd expect in the summer, but this is ridiculous. Very much above where we're used to seeing in many areas. Uh, by the way, that's a tornado warning in eastern North Carolina, northeastern North Carolina. Uh, let me just show you on radar scope real quick. There it is. It's luckily dissipated. It looks like, put this into motion, showed it looked like a little while ago. There it is. There's your hook echo. That thing crossed I-95. Luckily, like I said, it's starting to weaken and become way less defined. But that's what I mean. The weather has just been so weird. What a classic hook echo in northeastern parts of North Carolina in mid-July. Very strange. So in the desert southwest, it's hot, but there is some monsoonal activity. Tomorrow, I'm going to fly out to Las Vegas and go on Friday to Pahrump, which is over here. Let's get the old marker up right there. Why will I be going to Pahrump? Well, one of our good friends and colleagues of many, many years, his name is Paul. He lives there, and he is going to help me and our other colleague who's coming down from the Denver area for, uh, tomorrow night. The three of us are going to work on getting our Starlink set up in the back of a pickup, anchored down, ready to go, so that we can use it in motion. And what better area to test, right, than all of this remote region of the desert southwest. So we're going to go over to Death Valley on Friday and hopefully if everything works the way we think it will have live video all the time. Very important for these remote areas for covering monsoon. I think like a Dakota's blizzard during the winter time, uh, storm chasing per se in the spring and of this year it seems to be all summer as well in some of those remote areas of the plains. Not everywhere has LTE coverage. Of course it doesn't. We wish it did, but it doesn't. So Starlink, I think, could really help with that. We tested it several weeks ago in Texas. It worked great, Texas and New Mexico. Uh, but now we want to test it full time. So that's part of the reason why I'm heading out there is to do that. But the other reason is there is a little bit of monsoonal activity going on. It's been mainly down here in southeastern Arizona. A couple of outflow boundaries and a few dust storm kind of deals headed up towards Phoenix in recent days, but a majority of the monsoonal activity is down here roughly. It could spread up into the rest of Arizona over the coming days. The monsoon is a fickle creature, if you will. So my plan is to work with another colleague who's going to fly to Phoenix on Saturday. His name is Mike. You keeping up with all this? And he and I, uh, Paul will be leaving him when we're done Matt will fly back home to Denver on Saturday, then I'm going to drive to Phoenix Saturday, and then Mike and I are going to cover all of this area through here over the next several days from Saturday on. Testing Starlink, watching to see if there's any thunderstorm development, and just generally working on back-end stuff for the hurricane season. Yes, we can do that in Arizona. Why not? And we have all these technical people that help us so we're going to take advantage of it, kind of a working retreat, technological nerd fest for getting ready to make sure that we can give you the best coverage possible during hurricane season. And just maybe we'll have something down here that we can bring you if there's a flood somewhere, hopefully not in anybody's neighborhood. But yeah, we'll be covering the monsoon if it happens. Uh, well, the monsoon's happening if we get any storms. 
And the green is moisture, and over the next several days, plenty of opportunities for moisture to make its way into the desert southwest around that big old heat ridge. So yeah, there are some possibilities of some action, as they say. There's quite a few monsoon chasers that are out there. You're probably familiar with some of those people. Finally, one more name for you. We're going to meet a good friend of ours as well down in Sierra Vista. He works for the government, that's all I'll say. And uh, his name is Jeremy, and he is a big monsoon fan. And we always look forward to seeing him. Uh, I think it's been two or three years in a row. I think I saw him in 20, 21, and last year. So this will be the fourth year that I get to see old Jeremy down there in Sierra Vista. So a lot going on. I'm working with our team. Very exciting time with the technology that we have, especially if we can get Starlink to go full time for us while we are in motion. That could be really helpful, especially outside of traditional hurricane coverage where we usually use our LTE um, and uh, from Verizon, not a sponsor, by the way. We are full bill-paying people, thanks to the crowdfunding. Uh, but yeah, we use Verizon for all of our terrestrial stuff. And then Starlink, also not a sponsor. It's, it's all funded through crowdfunding. Um, you got to say this stuff or YouTube gets mad about it, I think. But um, yeah, the terrestrial stuff works great, but in case it doesn't, we want to make sure we have Starlink as a backup. It does work pretty well. All right, I think I've covered everything. Let's get this online for you. As always, thank you for tuning in and giving me a part of your day. I appreciate it. I'm Mark Suddeth, Hurricane Track. Oh, before I sign off, obviously I won't be around tomorrow uh, because I'm traveling, but hopefully Friday I can get an update in. At the very least, I will be tweeting, and I can do some stuff there, so follow on Twitter if you're not already, at Hurricane Track. And yes, eventually, one way or the other, I will get an update out as we watch what happens with this system down here in the Atlantic. Just not tomorrow, all right? Now I can sign off. Mark Sadoth, good to have you. We'll talk again sooner rather than later.